first off, I'll just say, you know, addiction is one of the most hopeless and helpless things that you could ever experience or go through in this life. Not only for the person who is struggling with the addiction, but also to their loved ones. Um, what that causes you to do is pick up as a loved one, pick up this savior complex and you feel like it is your job. You make it your mission. You make it your priority. You do everything you possibly can to save your loved one from what it is that they are going through in their addiction or from the addiction itself. We're here to tell you, you cannot save them. Like yeah. you cannot save them. You can encourage them and push them in the right direction to get the help that they need, but you cannot save them. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do you believe in life after addiction? You better believe it. Believe it. Believe it. Now, the host of Life After Addiction. Yes, sir. Welcome back. Life After Addiction. Today, we want to talk about uh, what do you do if a loved one of yours or someone that you uh, care about, love, uh, has an addiction or you believe they have an addiction. But I'm sorry, guys. I got to take this. Oh, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> I know him so well. Whenever he said Rocky that, top, if y'all could have seen Carlos's face, me. he got all serious. He was thinking we were going to cut. Not, I know this dude. Oh, so well. here we go. Rocky Top, coming. Tennessee. Why am I playing that song? Shout out, dude. Look, I'll give it to you. Y'all won. Y'all won. So we had an agreement, and I have honored it. That well, We heard us talking about it. We started talking about it when the World Ser- College World Series began. Uh, Texas A&M and Tennessee were just in it. They were in two different sides. They both had to win a ton of games, but we had a conversation. Man, what if we played each other? And he was like, well, what if? And then we got into it, and we made an agreement. We aren't going to talk trash <laughs> until the next time we record. I didn't. We I mean, won he's to, he's we, literally we just won. been relishing for this moment. I mean, just – You know how many texts his, I last, had to How delete? many weeks has it been? I think just a week. Oh, dude, he has just been on pins. I've and needles deleted for this so moment. many texts. I've so, had them written out that I wanted to say because you know he talks trash. Before, <laughs> dude, if you know me, you know that's not true. So I mean, this is. I've like, had to delete. I said I said I wouldn't say anything. I said I wouldn't say anything. So I've deleted so many texts, so many emojis, so many videos. <laughs> I even had my son ready to send you something. But yeah, it was a it was a good game. I just figured we'd talk about it to start this podcast off. With yeah, those. I knew I knew when you first started reading no, what we were you talking about today. I you knew, hope I forgot. You, we've never, I don't think, ever in the history of life after addiction have we just started a podcast like right away like that and got into it. So I knew he had something up his sleeve. Shout out to Tennessee. They yes. uh, they won. Um, obviously, America is disappointed. Well, everybody at home was was disappointed. We and. Been, uh, been dancing you know every dog has its day is how this the saying goes and so their dog and the dog had their day and man let them relish in the moment and congrats I, you know a few I, amazing things uh i think it would have been both of our schools first time winning it uh but also one of our players hit um a hit for the cycle which means he hit a single double triple good. and nice. a home run that's the second time in history that it's happened in the world series first time was in the 50s i think so it was a cool. It was cool, man. Both teams were. It was fun to watch, it was especially because we kind of had a little rivalry. But man, I don't think you would have kept your word if A and M won. Kept my word in what? Not saying anything until today. Oh, a hundred percent. That's easy Dude, for me to do, bro. You would look, have sent I me live so in Tennessee many messages with a bunch sent- of Vols fans who every look. Listen, this is the one thing that I've learned being in Tennessee. If you say this is our year long enough, my brother, it's bound to happen. So just say it every year for your entire life, and hopefully you live a long life. And, man, at some point, at some time in your life, if you say this is our year every year, man, you get to say the words, I told you so. And so, look, you get to say that now. I literally don't think we've ever had that conversation. (laughs) Uh, I think we first, and it's recorded, we first started talking about a few episodes about the World Series. But it was good. We can move on. But I still hold to you definitely would have texted me numerous times uh, after the championship. No, I mean, they clearly saw last episode who was the better friend. So, I mean, it's it's the proof. You know what? I've only seen one comment. Uh, When we asked about who, I think one of his questions he put up was who likes lying more. And we said, leave it in the comments. And I said specifically, Nicole, 
And Gordon <laughs> couldn't comment. You know the one of the ones only ones I saw that commented? Who? Nicole. And she said, My baby wouldn't lie. And I can't then she help called that my family's some of the biggest fans you, of the podcast. You brought her into lying I did, by I did not. by backing you. I did not. No, it was fun. I, I enjoyed that. We needed that, man. Last time we were in studio, it was pretty heavy. Um, personally, ministry. Um, some cool things happened. I'll put some pictures up here. Uh, we broke ground on a new 26-bed yep. facility, man. I'm so excited about that. It's going to be state-of-the-art, and it's actually going to be able to um, open us up next year uh, to potentially start um, uh, to open up a women's facility. So, wow. so yeah, we're, uh, we're excited about that. These pictures, as you saw, are pretty cool. Um, and I'll make sure that you have those. But, yeah, uh, but the pressure of leading up, that's where I was, the pressure of leading up to that, trying to make a deal with the lawyers in the bank, and then – making sure we get to the point where we close and then some personal things, a friend of ours and um, some other stuff. It was just heavy. So that episode was fun, man. We needed yeah. that. That was pretty fun. Um, and then today, man, this is a serious topic. I think we've discussed some things like this before, but I hope, um, I hope that, that we um, we're, we're a help here because there's definitely some things we could talk about. So what to do if my loved one has an addiction, you want to start, or you want me to start? Uh, go ahead. Lead us in. I feel like this is something that we've, we talk about yeah. frequently, but it's because man, like the truth doesn't change and what you need to do. If you're, lo you find your loved one in an addiction remains the same. And yeah. so, yeah, go yeah. ahead. So, so I'll, I'll do the, uh, uh, so understanding addiction. I think what we, if you opened up Webster's or if you wanted to know what the secular world said addiction is, it's not what we're going to say addiction is. We believe biblically addiction is idolatry, not adultery, but idolatry and, and, we're exchanging the glory of God and his goodness and his promises um, for bootleg substitutes. We're changing out those things for lies that God says that um, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest for your soul. He says to come to him for all these things and all of his promises, whether you're having bad times, good times, whatever. Um, and for me personally, man, I was exchanging those promises, his glory, his goodness for something bootleg that temporarily did feel good, but caused so much devastation in my life. And so that would be a 10,000 foot view. So if you know someone who's struggling with addiction, man, that's what we believe the root of it is. Uh, somewhere along the, along the way, they're exchanging what God says. Maybe they've never heard what God says. Maybe they don't, they didn't come up in church, but man, they're filling some void with a bootleg substitute, whether it be alcohol, a pill, porn, whatever it may be. It is, it, it's designed to kill them. Uh, and, and that's, that's, that's what we believe about addiction. Um, man, emotionally, psychologically, physically, absolutely, it's a real thing. Medically, if your loved one is battling with alcohol or benzos, man, that is a very serious medical situation. It can't just stop. Uh, we want to talk about this from the get-go because a lot of people don't know that. You can't just be like, hey, man, just stop, and you're just going to lock them in a room. Yeah. Man, that could be dangerous. They could have seizures. Uh, and so they'll need some sort of medical assistance, medical detox, not medical assist, um, assisted treatment, not MAT, but like, seen by a doctor, medically taken care of, so those seizures are, that they don't have the seizures, and if they do, they're in a medical situation, they won't die, because that's a very dangerous thing. Opiates, which is a large number of the populace when it comes to addiction, they'll feel like they're going to die, but they're not as dangerous as alcohol uh, or benzos, and so they'll probably want or need a medical detox as well. Um, and so they're, you know, physically, psychologically, emotionally, man, I remember going through, um, I became in the throes of addiction. It's almost, I became the ultimate narcissist. I cared about no one but myself. Yeah. Uh, and that's not who I was. So don't think that their loved one is that, uh, they've become that, but that's not at their soul at the, at their heart level. That's not who they are, but that is what they're doing. I, I would do, uh, I went further than I ever thought I would go, man. And, and the, mainly the people that I heard is who I love the most. Yeah. Um, and then, um, I remember afterwards, man, when the drugs were gone, I was no longer numbing, no longer taking the bootleg. And I had done drugs for so long and numbed for so long and not felt for so long. I remember when I stopped, and I hear this all the time, and I think you and I have even talked about it. When I had stopped the chemicals, when I had stopped numbing, it was like a flood of emotions came in, man, and I would cry because the temperature changed in the room or whatever it may be. It just, and I, so I felt like I was crazy. And if you're listening to this and, and you're in that position of, of man, you're, maybe you're there, you stopped and you're on day whatever, and you just feel so emotional. The only thing at least I told myself was, man, at least that's not broken. At least I didn't numb for so long that that's broken. At least I'm still human. And so that gets better. Uh, and so these are just some things uh, for you to kind of keep an eye on uh, of understanding addiction. Um, 
know this in Psalms 34, 18, it says the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Um, so that's kind of just an understanding addiction for the loved one. Why don't you tell them about how they should respond if they do believe someone is going through addiction, uh, how they should respond? Yeah. First off, I'll just say, you know, addiction is one of the most hopeless and helpless things that you could ever experience or go through in this life. Not only for the person who is struggling with the addiction, but also to their loved ones. Um, what that causes you to do is pick up as a loved one, pick up this savior complex and you feel like it is your job. You make it your mission. You make it your priority. You do everything you possibly can to save your loved one from what it is that they're going through in their addiction or from the addiction itself. We're here to tell you, you cannot save them. Like yeah. you cannot save them. You can encourage them and push them in the right direction to get the help that they need, but you cannot save them. You know, we work with families every single day and they have good intentions, but good intentions doesn't make something a good decision. So one of the first things I would say on how to help a loved one who's struggling with addiction is we've got to stop enabling our loved ones. Yeah, man. We have to. We have to stop enabling them in the sake of saving them or helping them. We cannot do that. As, as a, someone who has struggled with addiction, I take every single out that I have from every single friend, from every single family member, from every single loved one. Yeah. I will use and abuse every single out that I have until I know there is no more outs with them. Bingo. Until there is no more outs with said person, man, I'm going to exhaust every single option of using them, abusing them, manipulating them, getting money from them, doing whatever I possibly can to get what I need to get my fix, to, to, to feed my uh, addiction. And so we have to set hard boundaries, draw lines in the sand of saying enough is enough, whether that's not giving them any more money, whether that's kicking them out of the house because they have refused to follow the rules that I have set, whether that's, you know, failing to maintain a job and so you no longer provide them uh, with, you know, car payments or this, that, or the third. Like, you have to draw hard lines in the sand. And I know how hard that is because I've seen it time after time after time you essentially feel as a loved one that you are giving up on your spouse on your son on your sister on your brother whoever the person is that's struggling with addiction your mind tells you that you're giving up on them when in fact no you are helping them to the highest degree you could possibly help them by refraining and stopping uh, stopping to enable their behaviors and their habits but you have to draw a hard line in the sand and say enough is enough. This person who's going through addiction is thinking illogically, irrationally. Yeah. Everything they're doing is not going to make sense. I tell families all the time, you can't rationalize the irrational. Addiction is very irrational. What I mean by that is decisions they make. Obviously, like Adam said, we know it is idolatry, but based off the decisions these people are making when they're in the midst of addiction, you can't rationalize it. And so we spend so much time asking why, 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 and we're trying to do everything we possibly can to help them. But really what happens is we just end up enabling them and so drawing hard lines in the sand uh, setting boundaries and sticking to those boundaries Adam says you make it as hard as you possibly can for your loved one to stay in addiction and you make it as easy as possible for them to get the help that they possibly need yeah yeah and he mentioned uh, um, I was actually gonna add that but you, you you said it that was great but you mentioned uh, Chitty mentioned that you can't be their savior and here's something that I just I want to challenge you, um, family member, loved one, uh, if, if this is you. So often what we see, and man, it, it happens with the most purest of intentions, mm -hmm. like, like the most loving of heart. But we see the loved one's identity become wrapped up in being the one that's helping and saving. And so what that does, and, and like track with me here because this is crazy. It's this crazy cycle. It actually is, is a part of the enabling factor that it, it benefits now your identity to keep them in bondage. You're not keeping them in bondage, but you're doing things because now your worth, your value is always being savior, always being the one that helps. Uh, and like he said, we don't need to keep repeating everything, but I'm in that moment in, in addiction, when, when we are in a life of addiction, we will never choose the right thing. And so that's what nope. he was saying. If, if you give me an inch, I'm taking it. If, if, if I can convince you, and, and an inch could be, I still know I can manipulate them. Yep. They're the part of the family or they're the friend group, friend group that I can still manipulate and, and get 20 bucks from or get, a, get sleep on their couch yep. or, or 
they're going to help me not go to rehab or whatever it may be. I'm not, I have forfeited my ability to make great decisions because I've become so involved in this idolatry that I'm the most narcissistic human alive and no one matters but me. And the only thing to me that matters is something this big or a bottle or whatever it could be. Uh, it's a crazy cycle. And we don't say the things he said, this is, I think we have to spend a moment here and not move on because he's told, he listed things like kicking them out, cutting them off, doing, we say those things very fluidly because we've done this for combined, you know, close to 20 years. Man, we are acknowledging though, those are really hard things yes. to do. And, and I mean, the fear that I'm, that you're going to hear if, if you're in this place, like I just can't kick them out. I can't put my kid out. The fear that you're having is man, they, they could die. And honestly, I, they could. Mm-hmm. That's a reality. Yep. Um, and the only the only thing that I say in opposite of that is they are slowly dying now. If they are not corrected from this path, that is the ultimate ending game. So so they're either gonna the risk of doing the hard thing, and I know that fear, but just just allow yourself to understand that that is love. You doing the hard thing that radically change what's going on in their life is love. If not, the path that they are, this enabling path, they will die. At best, at best, be in prison. And that's not, that's, you might, I mean, do the hard thing. Uh, know that it's not going to feel good. We're acknowledging that. But know that we're telling you as people that have, have come out of this is that, man, that's what happened to us. We had a, a family that had a, and it took them a long time. There's grace there. If you've, if you've not done it this way for a long time, trust me, we, we weren't, both weren't addicted for six months, then went to rehab. We both have years of walking in a life of addiction. Our family's having to learn and, and eventually do the really hard thing for us. So, Yeah, so that would be the first thing I would encourage families to do. Set firm boundaries, stick to those firm boundaries, and do not uh, no longer enable your loved one. Like Adam said, that is probably the most difficult decision and choice that you'll have to make. That is, bar none, that is probably the most difficult decision and choice you have to make. But it is essential to give your loved one the highest probability of getting the help that he needs. Now, the person still has to make that choice themselves, but you're ushering in that or you're expediting the process of him potentially making that decision whenever you stop enabling and you stick to your firm boundaries. The second thing I would say is, man, research some Christ-centered recovery facilities in your area. So then after you've set those firm boundaries, After you've stopped enabling, now find the resources that your loved one needs in order to get the help that they need. A lot of the families I work with and deal with, they they have no idea how to handle someone who's going through addiction. Completely understandable. Find out who the people in your area are who can provide you with the resources that you need when the time comes. When you have those resources and you've accumulated Christ-centered recoveries and you've talked to the programs and you've talked to the places, get you a feel for, man, what, what place seems right for my loved one. I wouldn't be... I wouldn't say be too picky, but also use wisdom, right? Use discernment within that. Pray through these decisions. Once you feel like you have a few um, recovery places that would be a good fit, present those to your loved one every time you talk to them. No matter how bad they make you feel, no matter whether they want to hear it or not, this, that, or the third, you're planting seeds of faith. If you are a person of faith, what you're doing is planting seeds of faith, and you pray over those seeds of faith that you plant. Like, God, someday, some point, sometime, speak to my child, speak to my loved one, speak to my spouse, God, and let them know that, hey, you have resources. There is an out. There is a way out if you ever desire one. Yeah. I'm going to ask you in just a second to, to tell them um, that are watching what are some good questions that they should ask when calling these places. Uh, but marinate on that for a minute. And when I come back, please, please deliver those, those things. Um, yeah, I, I think I think go to your church, find find guidance, um, and have grace because a part of our mission in S two L and a part of um, some people that we recently partnered with is to educate the church of this stuff because it is very important where they get help. Um, but go to your church, ask them. A lot of churches nowadays they have counselors and things like that, and so they should hopefully, Lord willing, have a good resource list for you to call. But the main thing when you're looking up these places. If we believe strongly that it needs to be Christ-centered, uh, for for multiple reasons, you can go watch 
any other episode and find that out. But go to go to find uh, your church. Go to people that you know are walking with the Lord and, and, and ask guidance. You don't have to have the answers. But this whole shh, this whole uh, man thing of, of uh, what's it called? Uh, there's a stigma. This whole yeah. stigma stuff and trying to like a part of my wife's situation was, man, she for so long – didn't didn't want to talk about wanted to just kind of white lie for me. How's Adam? Oh, he's working. You know, it's Saturday at eight p.m. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, he's just he's just yeah. He just whatever. And so it was kind of covering for me. So forget that stigma. Go and get guidance. Uh, there's some scripture, uh, Proverbs eleven fourteen, where there's no guidance, a people fails, but in abundance of counselors there is safety. So. Don't go and blat your business all over the place, but man, to some believers in your life, if you don't have those people in your life, man, that could be an indicator that you need to get plugged into a body of believers and some people that you could trust with this stuff and are going to guide you well. And so let's say they've gotten the guidance, they've gotten a, some, a list of 10 places to call. What are some of the things, what are some questions that they should ask about, you know, tell me about your facility that should be good things and maybe red flags. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say for starters, like, what do you teach at your facility? What is your uh, ideology behind addiction? How do you define addiction? How do you overcome addiction? Obviously, we're saying find a Christ-centered recovery facility, but if you're calling facilities, that would be a good question to ask. What is your ideology behind addiction? A second one would be, what is your curriculum? Mm -hmm. So what does your curriculum at your program look like? What is my loved one going to be learning during their time in your program? I would find out how many staff members they have according to how many service recipients they have. Is it a good staff to SR ratio? Do they have enough staff to tend to the flock? I was just talking to uh, a family the other day where their son went to a place where there was literally four staff members and 70 uh, service recipients in the program. That's, That's going to be tough to get the help that you need in an environment where there's 70 people going through a program and only four staff members. Um, another thing I would say is it Bible based. Do you teach the Bible? You know, is, is your view of addiction based off of Scripture? Um, it's very, very important to know who you are in Christ. If someone is telling you that your identity as an addict is always going to be that, but try not to be that, they're not teaching the Bible, even if they tell you that's what they are teaching. Um, another thing is I would ask, um, do they have licensed professional counselors? Do they have a medical team? What does that look like? How many times a week are they going to meet with a therapist? How many times are they going to meet with a recovery coach? If they have a recovery coach, um, have these, I wouldn't say this is, ex well, I would say it's important. Have the people, have, has the staff member there been through addiction themselves? I don't know, man, I don't know how to put that into words, but there's something Peer. significant to that yeah there's something significant because someone who struggles with addiction man you give your ear your, your ear is a little more inclined to somebody who's sitting across the table from you when they know you've been through the same thing whether that's right or wrong that's just the case with the majority of people who struggle with addiction they struggle to listen to people at least during the start of their recovery yeah. for anybody who can who they don't who they don't think uh, can relate to what they're going through and understand the depths of destruction and despair and chaos and things that they've done to their loved ones and things that they've seen and the shame and guilt and everything associated with it um, I've noticed it to be vastly beneficial, the fact that Adam and I and all of our staff um, have been through it ourselves. They're more inclined to listen to what you have to say. And it also displays the power and authority of God mm. whenever they know where, hey, man, I'm telling you, my life used to look like this. And now you see where my life is today. That is tangible evidence of God's power, tangible evidence of God's goodness, tangible evidence of these things. And uh, man, that's what spoke to me when I went through S2L myself. I didn't know God. I'd never really prayed to God other than I prayed to God to die. But that was about it. I never had a relationship with him. But I saw tangible evidence through the men who served me that, yeah. man, whatever this dude is saying, like there's truth to this. Like there's innately something different about him. He's got a, a, a confidence in his God that I can't explain. This guy's got a joy that I can't explain. This guy's got a peace. And so the Lord drew me in with the men that were serving me who had the similar testimonies to mine and they had overcome addiction. And now guys are looking to you saying the same thing. Isn't that cool? Praise God. Isn't that wild? Uh, I, I guess I just need to touch on because, man, this is an anomaly. Uh, everything he said was right. But when you start to Google Christ-centered, licensed, medical, therapy, all of that stuff, man. I, and I'm trying to say this humbly and not like 
sound sound pretty bad, but there's not a place there's not a lot of places like S two L. Um, and we're hoping to change that. Uh, but there are uh, there are a lot of Christ centered places. So some of them are like a year long program. Research, ask those questions. They're not going to have the medical and clinical, but they're still very beneficial for a lot of people. They're long term. They they have Christ centered at heart. Um, but we're we're kind of an anomaly, man. Um, and we're wanting to change that. We've actually trained um, uh, personally in our ministry because a part of the vision was train others. And people have seen that we got a license. We can we can accept insurance, that kind of thing. So we've trained three places, Christ Center places that are now licensed, and uh, I think one in Tennessee and two in other states. Um, and also, man, I think there should be an S2L in every state. Um, I think a part of that vision is like you heard earlier, we're, we're going to start doing something that we've been told for years. Every, the, from the first year that I started at S2L, 12 years ago, we were told we need women. A women's There needs to be a female S2L. And so, yeah. man, that, that we believe that that vision and that that is about to happen. We just so if you want to partner with us and help us grow, uh, we're, we showed you the pictures. We're breaking ground on on a new facility, but there, there's not. Have your expectations right because there's not a ton of places like what he described that's going to have all that and truly be Christ centered. One of the one of the things I would advise you of, I think anywhere you call, when the person on the phone hears where you're at, they're going to talk about faith based tracks. And I do this because it's a track that maybe they offer a chapel once a week that's led by the guy that graduated a few weeks ago. Um, you know, so just be yeah. careful. Know what you're asked specific questions about the curriculum, like you said, about the staff. Like, for example, and again, anomaly, anomaly, but we have 26, 36, we have 42 beds total. And that's detox and all of our beds at S2L. We have 50 paid staff members. And so they're not all, you know, but it's, it's, it's more than, it's less, it's more than a one to one ratio. Yeah. Uh, and man, it's needed. Uh, God's blessed us. It's, 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 there's places out there like it, um, partner with us and help us grow to make more S2Ls. But, um, yeah, Christ centered is key. Yeah. Um, another thing I would say to loved ones, um, who's, who's, you know, family members struggling with addiction, um, Put them in a position to be around as much godly fellowship as possible, whether that's dragging them to church, surrounding them with godly influences and individuals. Man, it is of utmost importance for them to surround themselves with good people. Obviously, they're not going to do that on their own time. But if you can facilitate them going to church sometime um, at some point, if you can facilitate them being around godly influences, um, if you can get godly people to go speak to your loved one at any point in time and just offer a word of encouragement and remind them how much God loves them and who they are in Christ and those things that is massively beneficial as well I think you read a Proverbs verse earlier but it's one of my favorite ones I think it's Proverbs 15 but without counsel plans fail but with many advisors they succeed yeah like you have to surround yourself with good godly people and we're when we're in addiction we aren't doing that so if we as family members can somehow facilitate that I know your loved one is going to isolate and he's going to hang out with the wrong crowd but anytime they are in your presence man if you can usher in godly people to be around them to speak truth to them in love with gentleness with respect but speak truth to them that's what they need to hear and like I said all we're doing is planting seeds of faith in those moment uh, moments and maybe they don't receive it right then but who knows someday sometime somewhere somehow that that seed may take root and God grows it and radically changes uh, the man or woman who's struggling yeah let me close with this uh, and then maybe you pray at the end for people uh, which we haven't we've done sometimes we haven't primarily don't do that but let me close with this um approach approach your loved one with care and love make it as hard as possible for them to stay in a life of addiction by the things that he said it's not going to feel good but it is right make it as easy as possible for them to walk into a life of recovery um seek professional help have good guidance like he said set the boundaries but trust in god and i'll end with this there is hope um, Amen. These two right here, man, uh, your loved one, we're, we probably have very similar stories, and I don't, I'm not trying to compare, but, man, I was and he was not the men that are sitting here today. Amen. There is hope. There is freedom from addiction. So you might not have a lot of hope in your eyes right now because you're a loved one, or if you're watching this and you're struggling, man, there's hope. God says that you could be free. He says that if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Uh, you know, you've got to choose. You've got to choose. When you, when you surrender your life to Christ, if this is for the person struggling, when you surrender your life to Christ, man, now you have options here. You're going to choose to seek him. 
You're going to choose to follow his ways, or are you going to choose to turn back to the idol, to the vomit? You're going to choose to, to go after the thing that's bootleg, or you can trust in the promises and the glory of God. There's hope. There's hope. Uh, why don't you close us in prayer for the people who love, uh, have loved ones or people struggling. Yep. Uh, let's just pray over them, man. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, God, uh, Lord, we just come to you right now uh, with heavy hearts, Lord. Uh, we deal with men in, uh, who struggle with addiction each and every single day. There's countless women out there who struggle with the same thing. And so I just lift up the addict to you right now, the person struggling with addiction, Father God. And I just pray that you would remind them that there is hope that is found in the cross of Jesus Christ, Father yeah. God. I know the pain they're going through. I know the heartache. I know the sadness. I know the hopelessness. I know the pain and suffering and shame and guilt. But you are greater than these things, That's Father. Right. God, there is transformation um, that comes from knowing you, Father God. You radically transformed Adam and I's lives, and you will do the same for all who call upon you in faith, God, in sincerity, Lord. Uh, I just lift these people struggling uh, with addiction up to you, God, right now, and I just pray that you would speak to the depths of their heart. Speak to the depths of their soul, God. Let them know today is the day to get the help yeah. that they need. Today is the day to call their loved one and say, hey, I'm ready to get the help you have been offering me for years, Father God, and I pray that you would make um, a path for them to get the help that they need. I pray that you would provide the finances, God. I pray that you would give them the ability to do, to make the hardest decision maybe they'll ever make in their lives and seek help, Father God. I lift the families up yeah. of the loved ones. Uh, man, I, I can only imagine how hopeless and helpless of a feeling that is, Lord. So I pray that you would comfort them, God. I pray that you would remind them that they are doing all that they can do and not to beat themselves up and be so hard on themselves, but to set firm boundaries, to stick to those boundaries, to no longer enable, but to present options for their loved ones to get help every time they see them, God. I just pray that you would protect these families, God. I pray that they would have hope, God. I pray that this uh, would inspire them and let them know that they're not stuck. They're not trapped. There is a way out. Jesus said he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him, God. So I pray that you would show up and show out in the, these men's and women's lives who are struggling in addiction. I pray that you would save their souls, Father God. Yeah. I pray that you would save their souls, God. I pray that they would spend eternity with you. But help these men and women who are currently struggling, God. Speak to them. Let them get the help they need today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're a male struggling or you have a male loved one struggling, visit s2lrecovery.org. Um, and if you're watching this after 20 or 2025 or longer, if you're a female, go to s2lrecovery.org. We'd love to help you. Uh, if we can't help you, we'd love to plug you in somewhere that can. Um, God bless. There's hope. There's life out there. Thank you for listening to this episode of Life After Addiction. Life After Addiction is a production of S2L Studio. For more Christ-centered addiction recovery resources, please visit s2l.net. That's S, the number two, L, dot net. For more information about S2L's licensed and accredited residential program, please visit s2lrecovery.org. That's S, the number two, lrecovery.org.